All right, so hello and welcome to UMDCast episode nine. Today we have on Dr. Irving Strauchler, an orthopedic surgeon and fantastic diagnostician who's associated with St. Barnabas Medical Center. Thank you very much for coming on today with us, Dr. Strauchler. I'd like to just start off by asking if you could briefly summarize your educational background and how you came to specialize in orthopedic surgery. I attended the University of Minnesota. I majored in chemistry. I then went to the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, east of the Mississippi. And uh, I graduated in 1973. And I took an interest in orthopedics, probably because I broke my ankle while I was in college, slipping on the ice at, in Minneapolis in the middle of the winter. I did an internship in internal medicine because I knew I was going to become an orthopedic surgeon. I figured it would serve me in good stead to know something about internal medicine, which is something I would encourage you folks to do also. But now a lot of training programs are integrated. So when you apply, let's say you're going to apply for surgery or neurosurgery or internal medicine, everything's kind of combined in one program. So you don't have to do a second application for your residency after internship. That was not the case 50 years ago. Can you imagine it was 50 years ago I, I applied for medical school? That's pretty scary, isn't it? <laughs> so you, you'd you skipped a few years in school, I know. What was it like being one of the younger people in your class throughout most of medical school and the, the following years? I kept it a deep, dark secret. Very nice. People who are my students, they would not appreciate the fact that I was younger than they. Yeah, that's very understandable. Yeah, uh, it's, a, so, it's an ego issue. Very much so. So what was your residency, or your, uh, residency like as an internal um, medicine specialist? Like, and what Well, was... internal medicine was an internship. Ah. I did my internship at Kings County Medical Center under the direction of a fellow named Ludwig Eichner. Ludwig Eichner was the worst year of my life. <laughs> so what was the transition from that into orthopedics like? No, wait, wait. I, ha I have to tell you more about the internship because uh -huh. you guys are never going to experience this. <laughs> Luckily for you, we were on every other night when we were doing pulmonary medicine. So that meant coming in at uh, eight o'clock in the morning working around the clock, getting up at eight o'clock the next day, working a whole day and going home at five or six o'clock. So you were working for 36 hours straight. That's now illegal outlawed as cruel and unusual punishment under the Nuremberg laws. And do you think that working those long hours made you a better physician? Or do you think that with the way that the hours are limited now, it's equally- It was total, total abuse. Served no purpose. Didn't, that does not make you a better doctor to be able to work with your brain asleep. Mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah, that is very interesting. So what was the process like of applying to your fellowship? Were you- uh, always like planning on staying on the East Coast or, or to your residency, I'm sorry. Were you always planning on staying on the East Coast or were you thinking about trying to go somewhere back out West in Minnesota? I, want, I wanted to stay, stay in, the, uh, in the New York area. And the other thing that you should know is uh, education inflation. Back 50 years ago, most, in, most residencies were three years. Now the residencies are four, five, six, seven years. Orthopedics is now about six years of residency. Back in prehistoric time when I did my residency, it was three years. So things are changing. And by the way, the other thing that you need to know is also doctor inflation or doctor depreciation. Back in the good old days, if you were a doctor, you either had a PhD or you had an MD. Now you've got nurses who want to have be called doctors. You have pharmacists who want to be called doctors. You have physical therapists who want to be called doctors. 
So when you show up in somebody's office and someone introduces you as doctor, you have no idea what their background is. Mm. That's scary for being a patient. Do you, going back to the amount of years that residency is, do you think it's better or worse that residency is so long? Do you think doctors are benefiting from maybe a six year program or do you think it should, it should, it should have stayed like three years? The more stuff you pack into your head before you go out into practice, the better it is. You know, the real question is question of economics. People don't live forever. And I'll tell you guys about a very interesting study done by two economists who had absolutely zero medical background, but they decided to analyze a question of, if you are a woman versus being a man, is it better to be a physician's assistant or is it better to be a physician? And they took into account the years of training the amount of money you made during your years of training, whether you were able to work part-time if you were raising a family or starting a family, and the number of years that you'd actually earn a decent living between the time you finished your training and you retired at age 65. Some people retire earlier than 65. Some people retire later than 65. But they use 65 as an average. And they used average numbers. What do you think they came up with as a conclusion? I'm asking all three of you. I think PA one. Now. Yeah, I think the physician's assistant might take that one. For men or for women? Debatably both, honestly. For men or for women? I think for women. I think for women. I think for men too, honestly. For, for women, what? Being a physician's assistant or a physician? Physician's assistant. You are right. That is the correct answer. You get the gold star. All right. And the answer was because as a physician's assistant, you set your hours. You can work X number of hours. You, when you're on, you're on. And when you're off, you're off. So that if you're a woman and you're going to start a family and raise small children, you're going to be taking time off. As a physician, it's very hard to do that. As a physician's assistant, it is much easier to do that. So in terms of dollars, they just, they, all, all, I anal, all they analyzed was dollars made in your, in your expected working lifetime. Physician's assistants have three years. Doctors have eight, nine, 10 years of training during which time they make next to nothing. So if you're a woman, it's better to be a physician's assistant. If you're a man, you're still a little better off being a doctor. Is that depressing or what? A, a little bit. Um, and I guess with those results in mind and bringing up that study, I was going to ask you, um, what was your experience um, having you and your wife be in medical school and residency at the same time? given, I mean, the results you just shared with us? Well, first of all, when you guys decide to get married, you want to, take, you want to pick someone who's caring, kind, and willing to put up with a whole lot of aggravation being married to a doctor. Because as a doctor, your time is not your own. And if you have a spouse who says, I'm ready to go out to dinner and you're on call, that can lead to conflict, whether you're a man or a woman. So you need to, you need to find somebody who is willing to understand that your life is not your own as a doctor, which is why, by the way, an awful lot of nurses end up marrying policemen because they both have lousy hours, a lot of stress, and their lives are not their own. But anyway, I, when I finished my, my medical school, my wife started at the same medical school. So the advantage, the advantage that she had, or disadvantage she had, was when she would come home and tell me who was lecturing the next day, I had the same lecturers as she did. So I would tell her all the corny jokes 
that she would hear the next day and all the punchlines should be ready for all the corny jokes because medical school professors never change the joke lines. <laughs> That's great. So um, I think <coughs> in addition to talking more about your career as a physician, so back when you were an orth like a trauma surgeon for orthopedics, what was an average week or just the day-to-day -day like? Was it different every single day or? Well, one of the advantages of orthopedics <coughs> or disadvantages, you're taking care of the entire musculoskeletal system. You know, if you're an ophthalmologist, you're taking care of eyes. You might see eye trauma, you might see glaucoma, you might see cataracts, you might see conjunctivitis. You've got a very limited list of diseases that you have to take care of, injuries you have to take care of. In orthopedics, you've got the entire musculoskeletal system to work with. If you're a trauma surgeon, you know, the, the, the kinds of trauma you see is almost unlimited. So now in orthopedics, as well as I'm sure a lot of other areas, people are slicing and dicing their specialties. So now you have hand surgeons, you have upper extremity surgeons, you have shoulder surgeons, ne uh, neck and, sp and, and low back surgeons, hip surgeons, knee surgeons, slicing and dicing. So you can have a group of 20 orthopedists and each one has their own little slice that they're responsible for. So you know more and more about less and less until what? You know nothing. You know everything about nothing, mm -hmm. okay? That's the key thing you have to remember. Don't put yourself in a situation where you know everything about nothing. And one of the things that I pride myself about, as I told Sam when he hung around with me for a few months, is I would joke with my patients, and the scary part is that half of them didn't realize it was a joke, is I would tell them, before I became an orthopedic surgeon, I used to be a doctor. So, you know, you, you have to remember that you're not taking a care of a particular body part. You're taking care of an entire human being. And, and here's the other thing that I told Sam should share those six pages of words of wisdom he gleaned from me. You guys familiar, are familiar with the name of uh, uh, Samuel Johnson and Bosworth? Do you guys take any English? No, no. I try to stay away from the English studies. Stay away from English. Okay. Okay. So anyway, there was a very famous Englishman named Samuel Johnson, and he wrote very little down, but he was very smart. He had a sidekick named, named Bosworth, who wrote everything down that he said and did and published it. So that's something you guys should look up on Wikipedia when you're done. So I sent my, one, my kids all the hard work that Sam did summarizing everything I taught him. It was a beautiful job, by the way, Sam. And one of my kids wrote back, I never knew that you had a Bosworth. That's funny. That's good. Um, so going back to how you're talking about everyone's slowly narrowing down their knowledge into nothing or knowing everything about nothing, do you think that there's anything that uh, a student could do to try to avoid this niche or that the entire medical school system could work on to try to avoid when you do your when you do your fourth year electives, once you decide what you're going to go into, don't make the mistake of spending the whole year studying that particular specialty that you want to go into. Because number one, doing that increases your chances of getting a good residency, but decreases your chances of being a good physician. Because you've got to know everything about people. You've got to know a little bit about every organ system because a patient's going to come in and say, doctor, I've got X, Y, and Z. Doctor so-and-so tells me I need to do this, that, and the other thing. What do you think? And you don't want to keep saying, I have no idea about this field of medicine. Don't ask me. I don't know nothing. Because that decreases your your stature in the eyes of your patient. You want to know a little bit about everything. You can give people a, you know, a basic outline and say, this is what I know. Go online, look up X, Y, and Z, and educate yourself. 
because just about every all the people you're going to be seeing are going to have access to a computer. And that has completely changed the way medicine happens. 50 years ago, we did not have Wikipedia. And people couldn't look up things. So they were at the mercy of the doctor telling them whether it was true or false. Now, whenever you tell somebody something, they go online and check you out. And what I did is I made a list of reputable medical websites for people to visit, like Mayo Clinic, like WebMD, et cetera, rather than going to some charlatan or some, you know, prevention magazine, eat these herbs and they'll cure your cancer. So Sam tells me you're a fantastic diagnostician. Would you Thank say, you for the compliment. Would you say that a large uh, factor of becoming such a great diagnostician is knowing a little bit about a lot instead of knowing a lot about nothing. That's correct. The most important thing about being a good diagnostician is developing the ability to listen and the ability to ask the right questions. One of the things that, you, that you're going to go through as a medical student is you're going to do your first two years they're going to teach you about normal anatomy than pathological anatomy. And then they're going to give you the course in physical diagnosis and teach you how to examine a patient and how to take a history. So the usual history, this is now we're not talking historically and we tell you how things changed. Back in the good old days, when you were a medical student, you did not know what was important and what wasn't important. So you asked everything and you wrote down everything. So the typical medical student's history and physical was 20 pages long for a hangnail, okay? And then when you became an intern, the history and physical went down to about five pages. Then as a resident, it went down to three pages. And then as an attending, it went down to one page because you knew what you were looking for. Now that you have electronic medical records, you've gone back to prehistoric times because in electric, you all are going to have to learn electronic medical records. And I extend to you my deepest sympathies. Um, so speaking of the involvement of technology and online resources, um, to the medical field and industry, um, with the new COVID-19 pandemic, a lot of doctors, have um, agreed to see patients via telehealth or on Zoom. How has that changed the manner in which you diagnose patients? I would be very, very scared to use telehealth on initial examination. Because as Sam will tell you, I do something very unusual. I actually examine my patients. And you have no idea how rare that happens these days. And I, when I tell that to patients, they smile and laugh at me and say, you know, I gave up on Dr. So-and-so because he never touched me. Part of being a doctor is human touch. People want you to touch them and examine them. That, that's part of the therapeutic uh, therapeutic uh, relationship. If you don't touch your patients, they think that you don't care. And nobody in medical school is going to tell you that. Okay? There's medical school stuff, and then there's stuff in the real world. I gave Sam a graduate course in the stuff of the real world. So when he goes to medical school, he is going to be psyched and ready, okay? So you have to be able to talk to a patient and listen to them. Someone did a survey, did the, went into doctor's offices. They were like a fly on the wall and, they, and with a stopwatch from the time the, the doctor asked the first question and the patient started giving them their history. How long did it take for the doctor to interrupt the patient? What do you think the number was? 10 seconds. 
Yeah. Around 10 seconds. I think it was something like seven to 10 seconds. Now that is sad. That is sad. Now some people can't tell a straight story. So sometimes you have to say, you know, don't confuse me. Tell me the important stuff. But you've got to let the patient talk and you've got to be able to ask the right questions. And sometimes patients will come in and what bothers them is psychiatric or psychological or social, but they can't get it out. And you've got to be smarter to pick that up. And the best example I can give you for that is I think I told Sam the story of Maria at Montclair State University. She was a cleaning lady. And years ago, I was, I was doing the workman's compensation for that college. And Maria would come in <clears throat> with one orthopedic problem. And I'd fix her up. Six weeks later, she came in with a different problem. Fixed her up. A month later, she came in with a third problem. This went on for like two years. All of a sudden, Maria stopped coming. And one of her buddies, Anna, came in to see me. And they knew these two ladies worked together. So I said, Anna, what happened to Maria? She stopped coming. And what do you think she answered me? Noria. What did she answer you? She said, Maria is all better now. Her husband left her. Okay. Her disease had two feet and, when, and aggravated the hell out of her. And she channeled that into orthopedic problems. She couldn't get it out. Her husband left her. Her stress went down. All of her orthopedic problems went away. Now, I wasn't smart enough to pick that up because they didn't know the right answer, questions to ask. But those are sensitive questions. And you can't... I'm sorry, Dr. Dr. Strackler. Dr. Strackler, you muted yourself by accident. I think you muted yourself. Okay, I'm back. Very back. What did I miss? What did you miss me saying? You have to be smart enough to ask the right questions. And you can't ask these questions the first time you meet a patient. Because they don't know you, they're not going to trust you. <clears throat> they're not going to tell you the truth. Another important lesson that I didn't know that I learned from a cousin of mine who was professor of medicine at Harvard. And he told me, a patient is not your patient until they're with you for six months. The first time you see somebody, they're not your patient and you're not their doctor. If they keep coming back to you for six months, then you have a therapeutic relationship with them and then they'll trust you and then you can talk to them about stuff that might be painful. You with me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is an important lesson that I learned from my cousin and I didn't learn in the school of hard knocks. That is definitely one for us to remember. And on the topic of the lack of examination from physicians and then there are all these big practice all these uh, big corporations that are buying out practices and encouraging as many patients to come in and out um, without with all the electronic healthcare records and everything and not as much patient doctor interaction. Where do you see the future of medicine going? Do you think that this is a, a trend that would be able to continue or do you think that eventually there's going to be a hiccup due to the lack of actual care? A better question you should ask me is, do I think electronic medical records have improved the quality of healthcare? And the answer is no. If you're in solo practice or you have one or two or three doctors in your group, all electronic medical records do is eat up your time and decrease the quality time you have with your patients. So right now, the average <coughs> insurance company, the average corporate structure expects you to see four patients an hour. So if you spend two or three minutes getting a history, two or three minutes doing a physical examination, and then nine minutes banging away at the keyboard as a data entry 
technician, which doctors have become, where does the patient benefit from this? Because you're checking off a whole lot of boxes that, that are not applicable to a particular patient's problem. If somebody's got a hangnail and you've got to go through 50 or 60 check boxes to put down yes or no for everything so that the billing company can, can charge a higher level code, that's not in the patient's best interest. All right, the other story that I told Sam, and I'm going to tell you also, is I had a good, had a good friend and colleague who went to Albert Einstein College of Medicine, like my wife and myself, except he was twice as smart as I was. He got an MD, PhD, and I just have an MD, so that makes him twice as smart as me. Okay, He went out to the Cleveland Clinic and became an oncologist. So he did research in oncology, got a PhD in oncology, and practiced oncology. He's a fabulous doctor, all right? He was at the Cleveland Clinic. Now, you can be the best doctor in the whole world. If you go to the Cleveland Clinic and move your family there, they give you a one-year contract, which means if you don't toe the line, you're out of work. That's not the way you treat professionals. That's the way you treat people who've washed the floors, not the people who, whose lives who, you, you, your, whose lives are in, in your hands. So that whole system, that whole corporate system of medicine is, is, is decreasing the quality of medicine and the way doctors think about themselves and the stress that they're under. Look, if you know that you control your life and the way you take your care of your patients is your business, not some snot-nosed MBA who's your manager. That decreases your stress. But if you're 40 years old or 50 years old, and you got a new 25-year-old, newly minted MBA who knows nothing about medicine telling you what to do, your stress level is going to go up. So this fellow was practicing medicine, oncology at the Cleveland Clinic for like 40 years. He's my age. So when he was like 65 years old, he got a new MBA and said, we've got a new policy. You have to see five patients an hour instead of four patients an hour. Guess what? If somebody's got cancer, if somebody's got cancer, you may need to take care and talk to them for more than 12 minutes. What do you think? No, I agree. Absolutely. What do you think? 12 minutes is, is a little bit short? So he, he asked the person to death and did whatever he usually did. Six months later, the MBA came back and said, if you don't toe the line, we're going to fire you. Well, guess what he did? He quit, moved across the street to university hospitals in Cleveland, and took all of his patients with him. They thought they were going to get rid of him and keep all the patients and hire some 35-year-old guy or gal straight out of an oncology residency and pay them half as much. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, if that doesn't scare you about your future in medicine and being a good doctor, I don't know what will. Right yes. now, when COVID came along and all, the, all this other stuff came along, I was not stressed out too much. You know why? I don't have electronic medical records. I'm my own boss, I'm doing my own thing, and I'm taking care of my patients the way I'd like to be taken care of. But when you guys are all done training in what, 10 years from now? Think about 10 years from now, you're gonna be out and actually taking care of patients. That's a scary thought also, another 10 years. Who the hell knows what's gonna to happen to medicine then? Who knows what's gonna to happen to the world then? Who expected COVID three years ago? So the other thing that you have to remember, and it's probably on Sam's sheet, and this you have to tell your patients also. If you think that you know what's going to happen to you tomorrow, you have a poor grasp on reality. Life is uncertain. Guess what happened to me two days ago, Sam? What happened? Somebody made a left-hand turn right in front of me as I was on my way to work. I'm sorry. Are you okay? And I smashed right into them. 
Well, are you okay? I hope everything. So now I have an unhappy car. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, the police determined it was the other person's fault. But guess what? I made it to the office a little bit late. Mm -hmm. When I got up that morning, I did not expect to have a car accident. I once Here's an example of, of grasp of reality. And some patients get it and some patients don't get it. I saw a woman who had been recently diagnosed with lung cancer. She had her surgery, being taken care of by an oncologist. I made the mistake of trying to be good to her. Now you have to be careful when you try to be good to people. My mother-in-law, may she rest in peace, had lung cancer. She was not a smoker. She had adenocarcinoma. That's a whole separate ish area of lung cancer. She survived 12 years. What do you think the average life expectancy is of a person diagnosed with lung cancer, 2021. Take a guess, all three of you. I'd say like a year and a half. A year. Sam? Six months. Around a year, nine months. The correct answer is one year. So I told her, she was like in her, in her mid seventies. I told her, I said, my mother-in-law survived with, with lung cancer for 12 years. So she looks at her husband and says, look at Dr. Strauchler. He gave me a death sentence 12 years from now. She didn't get it. The oncologist didn't give it to her. The oncologist didn't tell her what her, what her expected life expectancy. So I try giving her good news that, you know, people can survive a long time, she turned around and turned it and thought it was an insult. Guess what? She wasn't smart. And as I told Sam, and I'm telling you guys, one of the things that you have to learn in medicine is that surgical steel does not cure stupid. If a patient comes to you stupid and you do everything you can to cure their problems, they're going to leave you stupid. Mm -hmm. And while on this topic of a patient asking for a timeline like that, where it's really not something you're able to predict, how would you deal to that when a patient's trying, like a, a patient's trying to get an exact answer or a range out of you when it's really something that you can't tell because like. It, yeah. I quote Niels Bohr. You guys know who Niels Bohr was? Yeah. The guy who discovered quantum mechanics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Niels Bohr's fame, I, I always love quoting him. Sam heard this a hundred times already. Niels Bohr, who got a PH, who got a Nobel Prize, contemporary of Albert Einstein, a reporter once asked him to make some kind of prediction. So Niels Bohr said, making predictions is very difficult, especially of the future. You're supposed to laugh. Yeah. All right. So I tell people, I tell people life is unpredictable. The disease process is unpredictable. But, you know, let's say somebody comes in with mild arthritis in their knee. Well, I tell them now or, or moderate arthritis in their knee and they want a cortisone shot or some pills or some therapy or whatever. They're going to ask me, am I going to need a total knee replacement? So if they're 90 years old, the answer is no, because their knee will outlive them. If they're 50 or 60 years old, I tell them, if God smiles on you and gives you long life, sooner or later, you're going to need a total knee replacement. If he calls you back early, you don't have to worry about it. So the take home message is be careful what you ask for. And that's some that somehow, you know, gets people's perspective straight. And I've had people come back to me, you know, 10 years after I took care of them. And, and they said, you know, you told me 10 years ago I was going to need X, Y and Z. Well, you were right. Here I am. It's 10 years later. I need you to do X, Y and Z for me. So with diagnoses such as this in mind, 
What are some of the most common things that you see that you know would be preventable if people took the right measures earlier in life? Most of what orthopedists take care of are degenerative conditions, you know, joints wearing out. So for a lot of the stuff that we do, the only way you can prevent it is number one, being choosing your parents carefully, all right? If, if your mama had arthritis all over her body and your papa had arthritis all over his body and you weren't adopted, the odds are you're going to have arthritis all over your body. An awful lot of what doctors take care of in just about every single field has a genetic component. And that's why it's important to take a family history. If everybody in the family had Crohn's disease, the odds are your patient's going to get it too. If everybody in the family had rheumatoid arthritis, chances are your patient's going to get it too. And you might as well tell them now rather than letting them figure it out on their own. Mm -hmm. So then I guess on the other end of the spectrum with regards to your experience as a trauma surgeon, was there any type of injury or something of the sorts that you would see relatively frequently or more frequent than most things? Car accidents were common. Bike accidents are common. Slipping and falling on the ice is common. Mm -hmm. You know, what I tell people to do is to do yoga or Tai Chi, because those are the two, two types of exercise that have been proven to prevent slips and falls in the elderly. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a question. So in non-trauma cases, um, have the majority of your patients that come to you tried physical therapy before they come to you? Or do you refer them to physical therapy before exercising the um, surgical route? Now you're talking about the legal system as well as the medical system. It depends on the state. Some states require a physician's prescription before insurance companies will pay for physical therapy. As far as I know, Medicare requires a, a, a physician's prescription and recertification every month. You know, insurance companies are in the business of making money and the federal government is in the business of not spending too much money. So in New Jersey, 50 years ago, you had to have a physician's prescription to see a physical therapist. Somewhere along the line, the, the law changed. And now if someone can go to a physical therapist, get therapy and not need a physician's prescription. Mm -hmm. so, Other states are different. Mm -hmm. So uh, on the topic of um, expenses when it comes to medicine, do you think that action at like a federal level affecting things like Medicare, Medicaid, and new regulations regarding insurance would be the solution to all the expen unnecessary expenditures that there is in medicine right now? Well, I tell you about Ronald Reagan's favorite joke. I'll yeah. tell your two buddies. Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell your two buddies. Ronald Reagan's favorite joke was, quote, the scariest sentence in the English language is, hello, I'm from the government and I'm here to help you. Okay, so tell me what particular social need that the government got involved in did the government make better? Can't think of one right now. Okay, so if you were going to go to a professional with a problem, and you wanted them to fix your problem, the first thing you should ask is, tell me about your track record. How have you done until now? And if they're 0 for 100, you may not want to give them your business. Mm -hmm. um, uh, doctor, I had a quick question. This might seem a little abroad but, or random, but was it worth it? It, it sounds like you had a really tough time in medical school and the internship and residency. And it seems like sometimes patients um, can either be deceiving or not always telling the truth. You've been a doctor for a couple of years now. 
are, are you happy with your career choice? There's something known as a, as a random controlled trial. You know what random controlled trials are? Or no. double blind, something called a double blind study. You guys know what the word double blind study means? Okay. No. Double blind study means you've got a pill and you don't know whether it's going to work or not. So you take 100 patients and you take 50 in one pile, 50 in another pile. 50 patients you give the medicine and 50 patients you give sugar pills. And then you follow them for X number of months or years and you see if the pill that you gave half of them actually works because there's something known as a placebo effect. An awful lot of people you give sugar pills to will tell you, doctor, you cured me. Okay, so you have to get be able to get around the placebo effect. And what do you think this placebo effect in spine surgery is? This is a scary statistic. Somebody has a herniated disc. They did this experiment. I don't think they did it in the U.S. because it'd probably be illegal or or whatever. They took a whole bunch of people with big fat herniated discs. Half of them they put, took to the OR took out the herniated disc. Half of them they took to the OR, made a cut on the skin, sewed them up, and did nothing. Of the people they did nothing to, how, what percentage got better? 25%. 50. 70. The correct answer is 40%. Is that a scary number or what? Let that roll around in your head a little bit. Okay? That's what makes the practice of medicine so hard. You're not dealing with machines. You're dealing with people. People are complicated. So anyway, I, I, I got off topic. But w w I, was I happy doing medicine versus doing something else? The only way you know is to go back get into a time machine, go back 50 years and try doing something else and see which one you like better. There's no way of knowing. Was there any, any point in your life where you're between going to medical school or becoming like a chemist, like a chemist or anything? I know you majored in chemistry. I applied to graduate school in chemistry and I got into, into several graduate programs to get a PhD in chemistry. I'm very glad I didn't. Because as Sam will tell you, I don't, what's the word? I don't suffer fools gladly. And in the corporate world, you have a lot of fools. So I would end up getting fired fairly early in my career because <laughs> I don't suffer fools gladly. And the question you have to ask yourselves is, do you guys suffer fools gladly? So you have to go home, look in the mirror and ask yourselves that question. It's definitely a good question. Now my wife happens to have the patience of Job. So she can put up with an awful lot of stuff that I can't put up with. But anyway, yes, being trained in medicine is hard. The training that you guys are going to experience is going to be a lot less traumatic than my training. But your electronic medical records will give you more ag agita because I never signed up for that. I was, I was brave enough to say, this makes no sense. It doesn't help my patients. And all it does is eat up my time and decrease my time with my patients. People appreciate the fact that you look them in the eye and talk to them. Because with electronic medical records, you're going to be sitting in the exam room with your back to them, banging away at a keyboard. And guess what? I don't care who you are. The back of your head is not that interesting to most people. Mm -hmm. And that's all they're going to be seeing for most of the visit with you is the back of your head. Think about that. Now, that's scary also. Do you think that that's a problem that could be solved by having more medical scribes and other staff? Or do you think that it's... Yeah, scribes make a big difference. Scribes make a big difference. But the corporate entity that you're going to end up working for has to be willing to spl splurge on that extra salary. They're interested in making mega bucks. So, you know, you're, you're like so many head of cattle, you know, like, you know, in the, uh, 
you know, we'll t- you know, if you don't, if you don't size up, we'll take somebody else straight out of residency who's going to listen to us and not give us a hard time. Mm-hmm. So that, that's that's the problem with medicine. You have to choose who you work for very carefully, because that will determine your stress level. And what I determined a long time ago, and I suggest you guys also consider it, is once you guys get north of 45 or 50, you're going to have to start thinking about your coronary vessels. You want your coronary vessels to be happy. You don't want to die of a heart attack or stroke at the age of 45 or 50. So you've got to be able to make sure that you have a job in a work environment that isn't going to give you a heart attack and leave your wife or husband a widower widower. Mm -hmm. You know, I trained a whole bunch of people when I was teaching at the medical school. And a number of them dropped dead 10 years after they finished training. Yeah, that's definitely something that keeps... Stress, stress, as well as genetics. Yeah. Well, um, thanks for scaring us. (laughs) Yeah. You're doing a great job. On on that happy note, you're going to, you're going to, on that happy note, right? (laughs) Yeah, on that happy note, I think um, we're going to start to wrap up, but is there any last piece of advice that you would give somebody in our shoes that might be a little bit more positive than the last thing you just said? Every day that you wake up, you've got to look forward to what you do. And here's what I want you guys to write on a piece of paper and tape to the wall somewhere in your apartment or room, wherever you are. If you love what you do, you will never work a day in your life. You got to love what you do. And if you don't love what you do, you got to do something else. Okay. Now we're getting back to English, English literature. You guys got to read a little bit of English literature so that you broaden your horizons. Okay. There's a guy named Somerset Maugham, M-A-U-G-H-N. Have you ever heard of him? No. He was the 19th century English physician who did not make it in the practice of medicine. So he decided to become a writer and became a world famous writer, which unfortunately you guys never heard of. But in, in Eng- but English literature majors have heard of him. And the other guy is Conan Doyle. Have you ever heard of a guy named Conan Doyle? No. Boy, you guys, you guys need a real broadening. Conan, have you ever heard of Sherlock Holmes? Yes. Okay. Where well, we we've gotten this to, 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 to first base. Sherlock Holmes was written by a guy named Conan Doyle. Conan Doyle was a physician. And he decided to write in his spare time. He got famous writing in his spare time. He was never famous as a physician. So you guys have to have other things that interest you. You know, if morning till night, all you think about is medicine and have no hobbies, no, nothing to exercise with, nothing else to do, then life will not be good for you when you retire. Mm -hmm. Okay? There's There's the short view, and then there's the long view. Right now, you guys are concentrated on getting into medical school. That's all you think about. Well, guess what? That's the short view, and now you guys look at the long view. Are you going to be happy doing this for the next 40 years? So choose your specialty carefully, something that you're going to like and have other things to do so that medicine doesn't drive you crazy. Mm -hmm. That's a great piece of advice that I think a lot of people don't emphasize enough. Um, On that note, thank you so So much. So that's a happier thing to end with? Yeah. (laughs) Have I taught you guys something? Absolutely. Yeah, yes, there's been lots of Okay, great- take care, guys. Thank, Thank you so much. You so much. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Take care. Good night.